And we'll come back on our next session, which is all about performances and you know, performing the past and different kind of histories. So in this session, we are going to have three amazing speakers about amazing topics. So the first one will be from Georgia, who has finished her um, MA in public history here in the Union of York, just this uh, year, and ended her dissertation this week. Um, and she is going to talk about food. So it's a first have a lovely presentation from Kaylee, who is going to talk about her work uh, being an artist and how to present the past and histories working with artists. And then we are going to have Esther, who is doing her PhD uh, here at the Union of York. And she is going to talk about, uh, so she is interested in history in film and television, and she will talk about uh, the role of the community volunteer in the IT sector. So I hand it over to Georgia. Uh, hello everyone. Um, as Kitty just mentioned, I have recently completed my dissertation project and that was based around interpreting food history in the English country house. Um, this paper is sort of build, building upon that theme and it's particularly concerned with costumed interpreters in the historic kitchen, their role in shaping the space and also presenting food history to the public. Um, seeing as the theme for this year's GradCon is public history in practice, it feels pertinent to mention that the questions at the heart of this paper are framed by my own experience in a historic kitchen. This is me, in 2019, demonstrating to the public how to make Georgian ice cream in the historic kitchen at York Mansion House. Um, though I'm not going to be directly discussing this example here, the experience of talking to the public in this context raised some fundamental questions for me about how historic kitchens are interpreted. Indeed, it prompted me to ask how we might think of them differently in the future. For example, how can we bring discussions of wider themes into the historic kitchen through interpretation, using food and cooking as a gateway to discuss um, themes such as class, trade, labour, and maybe even difficult histories such as slavery. Um, historic kitchens are often amalgamated with other service spaces when they are discussed in heritage scholarship. Over the course of the last three decades, a curatorial trend of opening up these below stairs areas in the English country house has gradually taken off. This is regarded to be a significant democratising shift within the heritage industry, which Pennell describes as a tidal wave. Now that the trend is well established, kitchens within the English country house are understood, understood to be very popular with visitors, especially amongst family audiences, and they are thought to increased dwell time within historic sites. Historic kitchens often, often are presented as hands-on spaces, the only rooms where visitors are not constrained by the ubiquitous red velvet rope and there's no restrictions, no do not touch signs. This is often in contrast to the grand state rooms above them and they are considered to be very accessible, familiar spaces with easily consumable narratives and messages. I have some quotes here that I think um, summarise that sentiment quite well. Um, more recently, this perception has been complemented by a celebration of food history, and food is now thought of as an accessible hook through which public audiences can be drawn into the past and learning about history. The historic kitchen is therefore a valuable environment for historic sites wanting to attract audiences. With this in mind, it feels necessary to question some of the generalisations that have been made about the historic kitchen and other food spaces. It has been well documented that they are accessible spaces, but there is currently very little scholarship covering what exactly it is that visitors are accessing, what histories are being presented to them and how. I think existing ideas about historic kitchens, like the ones from Cox and Pennell that you can see on the screen, imply that learning and engagement in the kitchen is often simple, straightforward, and always meaningful, always beneficial. With a focus on the role of costume interpreters, this paper begins to try and question this assumption and ask what is really going on in the historic kitchen. 
These spaces have a lot of potential, but they are currently interpreted in a way that is perhaps counterproductive and which denies visitors the ability to gain new knowledge from the historic kitchen. Costumed interpretation is used across the heritage industry and seems to have found a stable home in the servants' quarters of country houses. Of the six sites that I visited over the course of my dissertation research, all of them used costumed interpreters or plan to use them in some capacity in the future. That was uh, regardless of whether they were run by English Heritage, the National Trust, or um, privately run. Um, most kitchens, dairies, and sculleries had costumed interpreters present, and they were usually performing food preparation tasks or cooking, and that was for public viewing. These simulations are considered here to be performances. As Anderson states, living history, which can be defined as an attempt by people to simulate life in another time, shares many similarities with theater. In examples discussed here, the performance is conducted in very close proximity to the audience. The distance between the stage and the auditorium is almost negligible. Costumed interpreters must also perform to audiences in a constant dialogue, acknowledging and maneuvering around their questions and comments. Due to the audience's role in this conversation, this back and forth, they might also be considered part of the performance. Bagnall argues that the boundaries between audience and performer at heritage sites are fluid. All visitors produce their own meaning from interacting with the site and with interpreters. It will be these interactions where costume interpreters meet with audiences and engage with them that is the concern of this paper. To illustrate different forms, different approaches to costume interpretation, two case studies have been selected for me to discuss here. We have the kitchen at Audley End and the dairy at Dunham Massey. Both Audley End and Dunham are historic homes in rural settings with large estates surrounding them. Um, when visiting both of these sites, I interacted with costume interpreters. They take slightly diff different approaches, which I'll get to in a second, but generally speaking, both of them use costume interpreters to bring their servant spaces to life. By placing servants in the space, they show the rooms as busy, productive places. Historic kitchens therefore become spaces of labour. This is significant as Deutsch argues that the crucial link to that it is crucial to link the history of work and labour with food. And Moon argues that best practice for communicating food histories is to show production processes, showing technologies in use with human interaction. By attempting to depict people inside of the historic kitchen, these sites are beginning to show the English country house as a lived space, populated by people as opposed to um, simply focusing on sterile, defunct objects. It achieves what Stobart and Rothery refer to as a significant reframing of the English country house. It is a reanimation re of these sites, uh, which otherwise can appear quite monolithic and static. Costume interpretation, then, does in some respects promote good quality food history and good histories of the English country house. It encourages public audience to think beyond the grand and aesthetically pleasing objects that are traditionally associated with the country house and encourages them to view, um, view different areas as sites of labour. However, when we dig deeper into these costumed interpretations, well, we find some issues with food histories, the food histories that they are propagating. First, we have Audley End. You may have heard of Audley End through the uh, Victorian Way series that they post on YouTube. Just like Mrs. Crocombe in the series, costumed interpreters on site or the end adopt first person language. They assume characters pretending that they are from 1881. They use uh, I and we and refer to each other as servants would in the servant space. As a result of adopting these personas, they lose the ability to compare and contextualize, contextualize the processes and experiences they are depicting across time. Haley argues that the ability to contextualise and explain differences in, for example, perceptions of taste across time as crucial if we are to avoid romanticised, nostalgic food history. The ability of audiences to interact with these interpreters is also somewhat limited by the nature of their first-person performance. Greenacre argues that it, this approach is often inflexible and re restrictive because of the interpreter's inability to step out of character. 
And this is actually something that I experienced firsthand. When I visited Orleans kitchens, it was unclear how I should partake in this performance. How should I frame my questions? And should I play along with the character's conceit? My experiences are illustrative of how the first person approach adopted at Orleans might further restrict a visitor's ability to gain context and new knowledge from the historic kitchen because of the difficulty in understanding the rules of engagement in this space. Speaking to a staff member at Dunham Massey, the second case study here, a fear of this discomfort within first person interactions actually motivated them to choose an alternative path, opting to use third person interpretation instead. This means that although the interpreters at Dunham wear a costume, they do not adopt a character. During my visit, there were costumed interpreters in the dairy demonstrating butter making, so that's what you can see here. To describe servants in the past, they would use phrases such as they did, she did, he did. They also use modern equipment for their demonstrations. Alongside Green, uh, sorry, according to Greenacre, um, this third person approach allows the interpreter to evaluate, make comparisons and provide perspective when inter interacting with the public. It should also, in theory, lead to the ability to contextualise and evaluate the practices on display. However, at Dunham, this ability to compare the past and the present is not properly utilised, or I would argue it's not, and was even counterproductive in some cases to a good understanding of food history. Interpreters made remarks such as, this process is very weather dependent. They would have had tricks to deal with that in the past, but we have lost that knowledge now. And the milk that they would have used was a lot creamier than what we have now. And these statements uh, encourage a feeling of longing for food and food processes of the past. It provides a sense of food being proper in the past, fresher, homemade, and better quality. And that idea is created without any further critical engagement. A, um, <clears throat> a noticeable aspect of this nostalgia for wholesome food and lost skills in the past is that it derives from a generic uh, a generic past, therefore the nostalgia that is reflected in the statements is not for a specific time but instead for an imagined idea of country life and a way of living. This is a danger that Haley warns about. He argues that nostalgic experiences of the past are produced when food is not properly contextualised. The food itself is discussed in a way that is devoid of any wider historical meaning um, links to bigger issues such as trade and community are disguised. Here, the accessibility of food in the kitchen space is working against the production of new historical knowledge. Food memories and existing perceptions are played into rather than being challenged or supplemented with a nuanced understanding of food in the past. The positioning of the interpreter as a historian with the ability to evaluate um, is not utilised to create challenge nostalgic ideas about food in the past. Instead, in some cases, they actively reinforce them. The word they also implies an othering of people in the past, positioning the interpreter and the visitor in opposition to people in the past. Um, Moon argues that this should be avoided if high quality food history is to be practised in museum settings. She suggests that the past and the present should be linked in meaningful ways so that we can see how uh, food systems in the past have evolved and changed and linked to our current habits today. Um, so even those two very small and brief examples begin to illustrate the ways in which current costume interpretation practices can be potentially problematic in the context of the historic kitchen uh, and when trying to communicate about food. Uh, performances from costume interpreters can bring new perspectives to the country house and to the historic kitchen, but they can also reinforce nostalgia and old stereotypes about food in this environment. Practitioners and academics have so far seemed happy to unambiguously accept that the historic kitchen is an accessibly, accessible, easily approachable space, but they have not thought about the consequences of this. This paper has brought this into question. Um, some of the performance performative interactions that I've described here were actually quite difficult to navigate for visitors um, and it has also shown the potential dangers of encouraging so much relatability and identification in the kitchen. These spaces can become simply nostalgic, something to mourn the loss of. This can be counterbalanced with reference to wider themes and more contextual information in the performance of co 
costume interpreters. Although certain things could not be avoided, for example, you could never completely omit the word they, then the introduction of these wider themes, and even linking these themes to similar issues in the present, such as food poverty, resource management, and sustainability, could mean that the historic kitchen becomes a place where new knowledge can be acquired, rather than simply reinforcing stereotypes. With minor adjustment, it is very possible that costume interpreters could facilitate these meaningful discussions through their performances. Thank you. I forgot to mention that you'll take questions at the end, so I hand it over to you, Katie. Do you mind if I turn the lights off? Oh, yeah. yeah, just for the glare. I'll be presenting my paper, Not a Red Rose or a Satin Heart May Give You an Onion. The strange title of Heritage Artist. Um, I'm in my, I was in my first year doing part-time MA at Derby. So I hope you enjoy the paper. Okay, this research paper, oh, there we go. This research paper will examine the relationship between historical research, heritage participation, and what creative choices one wants to make as a heritage artist in the public history sector. This paper will be examining the background of a working heritage artist, Rachel Carter, and her Standing in This Place project. We'll be examining, ex examining specific examples of how she uses community engagement and relationships between her co-creators to explore historical narratives, looking at how Rachel has honed non-hierarchical learning in a participatory environment, and how she has used this to produce the final piece of this project, which is a memorial to the enslaved women of America and the lace-making women in Nottingham, and who are connected through the cotton trade. I will also explore how Rachel Carter, as the originator of this project, has to connect all the funding from different organisations she works with, which in turn have their own outputs which are required, and how these inputs are, are, have their impact on a working heritage artist. Oh, so not too much. Okay, uh, background. As part of my public history MA with the University of Derby, we were asked to undertake, undertake a consultancy project. The focus of the consultancy project was to negate a substantial project with a heritage body or public history practitioner that would allow you to develop an expertise you could offer a future employer. I wanted to work with a heritage organisation that used podcasts as an output of their heritage programme and learn how to help how this helped build connections to community youth. I was fortunate enough to set up my consultancy with Rachel Carter and receive an insight to the real life workings of her heritage practice. Rachel Carter is an artist who was established in 2007 and who is working in the heritage sector. She started off as a willow weaver but quickly changed disciplines to start producing sculptural pieces using a combination of ancient weaving techniques and state-of-the-art digital, digital techniques. Rachel Carter describes how many of her commissions are underpinned by the love of history and ancestry and I feel honoured to be able to represent our shared and complex history with these sculptures. During the pandemic, Rachel Carter volunteered as a researcher on Dr. Helen Bates and the Legacy Makers, with, the, with Dr. Helen, Helen Bates and the Legacy Makers, for an organisation backed by Bright Ideas Nottingham, a pioneer social enterprise that coordinates a range of community-led arts, culture, heritage, and wellbeing programmes. As well as this organisation, she also worked with the slave trader Legacy family. She discovered a number of direct mem family members working in the cotton factory and lace making industries in Nottingham. As you can see from the slide, the sculpture shows two women clasping hands. These women obviously represent the enslaved women of America and the lace-making women of Nottingham and how they are linked. The project also hopes to address the imbalance of the fact that only 5% of statues in the UK represent women and even fewer women of colour. Standing in this place is a community-driven sculpture and has now... Uh, it is also... Uh, sorry. Standing in this place statue has now become part of a series of three statues. The first being Pilgrim Women, which is slide three, um, which, was, which Rachel was commissioned as part of the 400 year anniversary of the Mayfair crossing. The third in the series will be Puritan Women, which is in the process of being formulated and commissioned. She hopes that they will have statues in both Boston in the UK and Boston in America, and they will also have two HD, PhD placements created to help research the project and the history of these women. After establishing relationships with her co-creators, Rachel Carter and the choreographer, Dean McQueen, put a call out for local women over 50. Rachel Carter in her short film about this 
section of the project, described how the project got some amazing ladies signing up. And we looked at the physicality of these women, getting them to become living sculptures with careful consideration and slow movement. In her first statue of Pilgrim Women, Rachel Carter had herself had been the model for the photogrammetry rig, which was used to cast the bronze statue. In standing in this place, being able to use women from that both had connections to the uh, sorry, uh, being able to use women that both had connections to the women being memorialised in the sculpture was the end goal for this piece. Over the series of weeks and several dance workshops and historical talks, the women were organised into pairs and coached to become living statues. Eventually, a pair were selected to become models for the sculpture. This collaborative process between Rachel Carter and the choreographer and members of the dance troupe at every moment was created and discussed as to best represent the meeting of these two women that were to represent so much. Alongside the branch of this venture was also another collaborative project that would be researching and creating historical, historical accurate clothing that the models would be wearing. Rachel's Carter, Rachel's Carter worked with the Nottingham based Sugar Stealers, the diverse with collective of women who are using the creative professional and community connections to combat inequality and disadvantage, created miniature figures with the participants to create their outfits on. The, the, the participants were given miniature figures. These, uh, this phase of the project had to deal with, as Rachel Carter described, a common problem of, when looking at working class history, it's very difficult to find any information or clothing. Very little survives. So we rely on the help of the museum collections. We also had lectures from Dr. Susan Seymour. The volunteers were also equipped with large bank of materials that would have been similar to the materials available to the woman at the time. However, they were asked not just to think about the look, but the texture of the pieces, as they would be photographed for the creation of the sculpture, and the texture would be an important factor to the final piece. At the end of the research period, the members of the Sugar Steelers presented the figures and talked about inspiration and research that had gone into the design for the figures. The clothing for the final models were designed from an amalgamation of all the different designs and were put together at the end of the project, and a volunteer was selected as lead designer and maker of costumes for the models. Lisa Robinson, director of Bright Ideas Nottingham and founder of the Legacy Makers Group, described how finally seeing the two women in the costumes for the first time before it was ca captured on the photogrammetry rig as it was just mind blowing really. The amount of work that had gone into these costumes and they just looked so comfortable. My immediate thought was that the ancestors were just smiling down at us, the whole thing beautiful. A common theme throughout the project was how a community of women was established, not only through the art of creation, but also learning and researching into histories of how women lived in these two realities. As well as a number of workshops and information sessions that were created, historical research was carried out through every aspect of the creation of the physical art piece. The involving nature of co-production means the involving nature of co-production means that it can be a longer process. But Rachel Carter describes how co-production uh, how co-production of a means like this means that this is not just my work, it's the work of hundreds of women that they take ownership of the piece. It's their work and their sculpture and their legacy that they can go along to see the sculpture when it's installed at any point and say that bit is mine and share it with them, fun, friends and family. For me as a sculpture, I can leave the legacy, but to help others leave the legacy too is amazing. Nevertheless, Rachel Carter can, cannot be, Rachel Carter's work cannot be carried out in a vacuum. She is at the behest of funding applications and outcomes for a project. Rachel Carter's projects are multifaceted and made up of lots of different moving parts that need, to be, that need to help to achieve the goals at the end of the case. Due to funding constraints, I think can be felt across the heritage sector, large-scale funding is difficult to secure across the whole project from beginning to end. Instead, this project phases were funded by different funding partners. This can lead to, this can lead to somewhat unstable outcomes. And as the coordinator of the project, Rachel Carter, <coughs> a self-described working class female in the Heritage and Cultural Workshop. Um, yeah. In a recent United Nations development report, it shows how women play a dominant role in making creative products in the developing world. However, as someone from a working class background, I would argue this makes it her an anomaly in this workspace as social mobility and cultural workforce has barely changed since the 1980s. In the several meetings I had with Rachel, she often described how she had to become a business person in her own right to be able to secure this level of funding. She had undergone years of mentoring and business training to be able to manage the side of the business brand. It's not an underestimation to say that Rachel Carter would not be the artist she is today without the business acumen she has to have acquire. During my time with Rachel Carter, I, I witnessed 
how, as an overall coordinator of the project, a massive amount of unseen and waste work that goes into covering different funding, different funding outcomes of the funding cycle, whether she's successful or not successful, as well as the overlapping of the beginning and ending of an individual sub-project of the overall project. Hope argues in her article how difficult it is to pinpoint exactly when a project ends, as it is not always straightforward because of the running out of funding is not always conceived with the activity's natural conclusion. Rachel Carter must produce multiple outputs, such as a piece of art, community outreach and engagement. And as part of her funding remit, the projects must also develop, uh, demonstrate, provide the value for money. For Rachel Carter, who works within the heritage arts medium, she's often, she often faces an, an acknowledged cost shouldered by socially engaged practitioners. Working in public, pub, publicly, so, so it's like working in publicly subsidised participatory projects. It takes a level of commitment and personal input to create these projects and deal with the difficult subject matter. My consultancy project aim with Rachel Carter was to help work on their second season of podcasts for phase two of Standing in His Place. The Heritage Lottery Fund were a major funder of phase two. She had submitted her application at the, for the, at the start of the consultancy and was expecting to have news of her, her bid in early April. Rachel Carter eventually received news of a successful application at the beginning of June. This is wonderful news. Nevertheless, due to the length of time after the deadline, she was under the unfortunate assumption that the project had been unsuccessful for over a month. The overriding communication between Rachel Carter and the HLF as an outside observer has been very frustrating. At this point, I must stress that Rachel herself has made no, at no point has expressed these frustrations, but, but at all and has worked tirelessly throughout the process. But as an outside observer, I would argue she's accustomed to these delays and poor communication structures. I would draw parallels with Elena Bellafori's argument that funders can easily neglect meaningful care both during and after the completion of a project. The artist Sue Braden looks back in 1978 describes the community arts needs to flourish with a long-term commitment from funders and that this commitment necessitates patient year-on-year -year programming in which communities and artists can grow together. In conclusion, oh, yeah, in conclusion, I feel that Rachel Carter has been, has been evolving into a heritage artist over her career, most notably after the commissioning to create Pilgrim Woman's statue. She was able to use techniques and experience on this project and build these into her next sculptural pieces. One example of this would be small-scale weaving kits were incorporated into both statues. In Pilgrim Woman, 42 women were incorporated into the piece. In standing in this place, 120 kits were given out and incorporated. Rachel Carter has evolved her practice and engaged with funders since 1990s. Um, Rachel Carter has evolved her practice and engaged with funders since 1990s, has seen a socially engaged art practice that has been increasingly successful in attracting public funding. Rachel Carter, just as a solo artist, I would argue, would find it more challenging in funding times to carry out this scale of work. The creation of Standing in This Place in Bronze, which is in the desired goal of the project, will be in the hundreds of thousands. However, Rachel Carter is a heritage artist who is using historical research to create the best public history practice that has a strong community engagement, combines historical research with physical output that are in turn into a piece of tangible art that creates legacy is arguably what the public history hopes to create. A meaningful dialogue between public engagement and the owner with owner and others. New learning and development, different versions of how we view the past. And uh, nevertheless, to achieve this goal, we need artists like Rachel Carter that can straddle many different and complex roles. Funders of a project like this ask a lot of the project leaders and perhaps do not offer the support and security that is needed to help develop and nurture this, public, this direction of public history. So we now have heritage artists forging the way forward, combining the strands of public history practice and outputs as deftly as any wooden sphere. <laughs> Wonderful to have you here. My name is Esther Wilson. I'm a third year PhD student um, within University of York's IPOP. Now, my thesis actually uses Hamilton to develop understanding of performance and social media within the public history field. But today I'm going to talk to you about something a little bit different, and that is my experience of recreating historical dancer with these museums and galleries. So, here we go.
Chloe Artson was our at Lobberton Hall. Um, and I've known community curator Stephanie, she's on the end there, next to me in costume, uh, for a few months when she approached me about getting involved in her upcoming community project, Homes of the Gascoigns. Based at Lobberton Hall near Leeds, the exhibition was designed to showcase the country estates owned by the Gascoigne family, who presented the state to the city of Leeds in the 1960s. The exhibition not only aimed to broaden visitors' understandings of the Gascoigne family, but sought to use community volunteers to, in order to share the stories of the real people behind the grand facades of Parlington, Castle Oliver and Craig Nish. With my interest in heritage and dance, this was where I came into Stephanie's schemes. So, a little bit of a roadmap. Um, oh, the font is different, okay. We're just <laughs> going to go with it. <laughs> I made this in slides, so perhaps it doesn't, it doesn't come across quite right. So, slight introduction there to um, what the project was, go through the, these viewpoints, talk a little bit about Lola, and then a few key aspects of what I want to talk to you about today. So this paper offers a reflection upon the role of the community volunteer within the heritage sector and the significance of using the amateur community voices in order to recenter heritage narratives. It problematizes some of the ways in which heritage practices can seek to bring to life particular stories about the past through embodied and performed narratives with particular focus on factors of characterization, choreography, and costume, which you can see some of these on our roadmap. In so doing, the paper explores the practice involved in community learning for the public historian in training, me, and highlights the value of community participation. So without further ado, who is Lola and why on earth was I playing her? This is Lola. Born Eliza Roseanne, Eliza Rosanna Gilbert, Lola Montez is most well known for her reputation as a 19th century international dancer and courtesan. Her escapades of absconding from a strict Presbyterian boarding school, several mysteriously missing men, evocative dances and involvement in the European Revolution are some of the key legacies left behind within general public knowledge. Lesser known, however, is that this dazzling self-styled Spanish dancer was actually a young Irish gentlewoman from the state of Castle Oliver in County Limerick, Ireland, who had finished her life as a penniless charity worker and penitent Protestant. Her life story itself is somewhat astounding. Montez was ousted by polite society, actually never went to Spain, and never took ballet training, but managed to tour the stages of the world, become lover of Bavaria's revolutionary Countess of Lansfeld, and develop an international voice in women's etiquette and toilette. My task as a public history researcher and dancer was to tell these stories, and I personally hoped to change some perceptions as part of a two-hour heritage event which ran last October. The afternoon was to have several components. An exhibition tour featuring my interpretation of Lola's famous spider dance, afternoon tea, and then a workshop on 19th century health and well-being led by myself. And it is the first part of this afternoon that I'm going to focus on today. In so doing, I also do want to give a shout out to my good friend, Emily Brighty. She's since moved to Australia, uh, but she was instrumental in leading the tour component in which the spider dance and my personal character featured. Um, and you'll see on some of the slides as my cousin, uh, Mary Isabella Gascon. Here we are. So I had a few immediate qualms about the workshop component of the afternoon. I have experience working in heritage settings, an interest in 19th century history, Lola's own publication, The Art of Beauty, was on hand to me, and my experience of teaching adult ballet classes made the sort of activity component of the afternoon quite natural. However, regarding the rest of the afternoon, various challenges had quickly presented themselves. Firstly, I was bursting onto an unfamiliar acting scene as a real historical individual. Secondly, in creating an event which aimed to effectively communicate the past to an unknown visiting public, and this was a programme that Lotherton had not previously run, I had to negotiate between my largely non-performative previous heritage industry experience and my normative academic forms of research and communication. I'd need to identify and call into question any personal assumptions about how to do heritage in practice. The task of character development and script writing, in particular, posed big questions about how to appropriately develop a sense of historic persona and navigate notions of authenticity within the context of the required work. Importantly, I also had to face up to the spider dance itself. How was I to recreate a historic dance with minimal and conflicting source material, and how does one communicate ideas about the past through dance, anyway? One thing that was made quite easy for me was my dress. So this, uh, you can see, back of my costume on the right here, and there's the um, sort of inspiration cartoon that we chose on the left. The costume was fantastically designed and executed by one of Northern Ballet's costumers, Julia Anderson, 
The costume was designed to echo the attire worn in this contemporary picture you can see here. And I do say costume, but really the garment teased the line between understandings of dress and costume as terms. With extensive experience in creating ballet costumes that sort of evoked a sense of period feel for the various ballet productions she's worked on, Julia recreated the 1840s silhouette beautifully without the requirement of corseted underpinnings and retaining the practicality required for movement. And having worn various forms of fairly authentic 1840s daywear as an extra of sort of period film on television, I marveled at the way the dress made me feel as a performer and a character, particularly in contrast to, say, all the corsetry and petticoats and layers I previously had to wear on the sets. And there is a short video of me here trying out a uh, costume part with the production, and I get very excited just trying to figure out, oh, look at me, my dress, isn't it fun? Um, and it really would have been wonderful to have known just how Lola herself negotiated uh, the balance of appearance, costume, theatrics, and movement back in the 19th century. We'll never really quite know. However, one costume decision that I did make myself was a last minute opt towards character shoes, which you can see up here on the top right for the performance. They're very different to the sort of slippers depicted within the portrait on the left. Uh, the decision was partially based around practicality, but it also encouraged me to think more critically about how we talk about authenticity as public historians. We don't know exactly what Lola wore for her performances of the Spider Dance when it debuted. The shoes depicted in the portrait on the left may or may not have been representative of that particular performance costume, but they actually certainly don't represent any shoes from the 19th century that I could really adequately recreate today. And the reason for this is that they depict Lola as being on point. As you can see here, she's kind of stood on her toes. Aesthetically, the portrait fits very well with many mid-19th century dance images. And you can see on the screen how contemporary ballet star Marie Taglioni, who sort of debuted the point shoe and point work, um, was depicted at the time. The portrait style of the photo on the left is therefore a very fitting decision by the original artist, given the wild success of contemporary romantic ballets such as Giselle and La Sylphide, um, which again, you see Marie here, she was sort of involved in those early very exciting, uh, now sort of romantic classical works. However, modern point shoes are extremely different to their predecessors of 20, so 20, 200 years ago. So my shoes actually look a little bit like this. You can see that they're sort of composite plastic made fabric. Um, and on the bottom here are Marie Taglioni's, who you can see here depicted, and I think it's probably a little bead. They are basically just reinforced leather. Um, they've adapt point shoes have adapted to the demands of ever more challenging choreography over the years, and it would therefore be impossible for me to accurately imitate this sort of look. We also don't believe, in spite of her claims, that Lola actually had access to any sort of significant ballet training, or was seen as sufficiently skilled if she actually did. Given the strength and technique required to dance on point, particularly without the more robust modern shoes, I personally think it's highly unlikely that Lola herself ever danced on point. Although the portrait was used for costume inspiration, the footwear shown is thus highly likely to be inaccurate or misrepresentative, perhaps comparable to contemporary depictions of ballet dancers, but certainly not in all likeness to Montez's own shoes. Cost restraints aside, this meant that the likeness of my ability to replicate appropriate, authentic 19th century dance slippers of any style was minimal. In spite of some extent by the portrait, the initial pair of modern flat ballet slippers chosen, which you can sort of see just on the bottom right here, felt to me too out of place with their cross elastic and form fitting shape. Anachronistically sort of clashing with the historical style of the rest of my appearance, they didn't feel like the best option. However, as Lola was known to style herself the Spanish dancer, I took artistic license and chose to wear my character shoes, which you can see on the top right. And these are something I've worn myself for the Spanish dance in the Nutcracker, um, which is a ballet generally understood to be set in sort of early to mid-19th century Germany. The character shoes with their low heels, striking black appearance, in contrast to the white tights, are also not particularly fitting, um, either for the sort of um, portrait you can see on the left, or for the 1840s in terms of accurate historical footwear. However, as the performer and public historian in charge of the choice, I surprisingly felt I'd made the right decision to rely upon period hair and dress silhouette as key indicators of period, and that somehow the shoes could add to this in their own way. And I'll talk a little bit about that with the choreography. So in spite of the sort of authenticity, the overall appearance and action of the shoes within the piece seemed to function well as an indicator of tone. 
After all, the imagery that could be conjured in the minds of 21st century visitors by Lola's portrait as a type of, sort of ballet dancer is actually rather at odds with the sort of movements and attitude reportedly involved in the spider dance. Meanwhile, the character shoes actually seem to facilitate a more accessible contemporary performance tone while retaining practicality and acceptability within the sort of 21st century dance context. Although I willingly opened the can of worms of historical authenticity, I do defend my position to have settled on footwear which better match the performance context of the piece. We cannot always represent the past literally, and indeed it's not always quite what we actually want to do. Instead, we want to translate and tell stories in a way that makes sense to the modern audience. Sometimes this requires compromises. So, choreography. Creating the dance itself was perhaps the biggest key challenge. Fellow volunteers were excited to see the choreography unfold, supposedly as scandalous as her reputation, and no doubt this is what any other visitors may have expected also. The piece supportedly debuted in Australia to conflicting levels of public reception. On one hand, an audience hurling golden nuggets, and on the other, shock and appall and an evocative sexual performance and the revealing of public nudity. It's difficult to know quite what the dance consisted of, but it's so called below the skirt swishing movements as if shaking arachnids out of her petticoats and stomping on them, in so revealing what was or was not underneath. The only footage I had to inspire me, however, was one museum-made film on YouTube, which wasn't particularly creative. When approaching the piece, I had three practical considerations in addition to my own performance capability, music availability, and restrictions of both time and space. The initial thought was to choose music from Franz Liszt, which is one of the many men that Lola was known to have had a bit of a fling or relationship with, um, and she also actually, side note, reportedly served the inspiration for Iron Adler in the sort of Sherlock series as well. So she's very well known, very well connected to sort of high society. Um, however, Liz's music uh, did not really match the length or the tone that I was looking for. Reflecting on Lola as a whole, it seemed to me that my spider dance ought to have a bit of a flirtation, sort of stereotypically Hispanic feel. And the music from Kitri's Act 4 variation from the Ballet Don Quixote seemed to fit the bill for sort of stereotypical tone, length, accessibility, and further supported by the character of Kitri as a feisty young heroine in love. Now, I may or may not have a very short video to show you of this. I'm conscious of time. Um, but one thing to note, that there's very little question I would not be aiming at imitating the 21st century understandings of Valesco Cabaret, for which Lola was arguably one of many forerunners. Convenient for the ethics of both myself and the museum environment, I settled on being unconvinced by the surviving press evidence that there was certainly revealed a lack of underwear in the piece. This came after being informed by curator Stephanie that much of the press about Lola was actually dominated by the Jesuit order, who were very, very unhappy with her after her role in sort of Bavarian politics and all the revolutions that happened over there in the mid-19th century. With some awareness of 19th century etiquette, I settled on choreography that blended sort of balletic Spanish style movements, which could have been considered evocative by contemporary standards, though very tame by modern expectations. With an idea of how ballet has developed as a dance style, I also knew the type of tricks that stun audiences today, like 180 degree legs, were unlikely to have been part of the routine for Lola. So I opted for said generally lower leg lines, which would have been more suited to the period of romantic ballets, if you think back to the picture of Marie Taglioni. Uh, but from perhaps a greater sense of dynamism um, and sense of attitude. And for the icing on the cake, Julie arranged for thankfully artificial, I hate spiders, uh, but artificial spiders to be sewn and scattered within the skirt, which meant I could literally stomp on the spiders, they, they swished my skirts and they fell out on the floor. Um, which was also obviously a movement that was really made even more effective by the choice of the character's shoes. And so we may not actually really know what the dance looked like in the 1840s, but both visitors and the Lothar team alike seemed pleased with the results of my interpretation. Um, can I go slightly over time and show the video? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't judge me. Enjoy this for a minute, please, whilst I try not to go as much as the area in the corner. It's very quiet. That's okay. That's actually maybe okay. Just, I'll be quiet.
October. <laughs> I really wanted to include that because uh, there was no way I was going to perform it in real life, and I also hadn't laid with Stephanie about borrowing the costume and thought that might be quite hard with like you know doing hair and makeup in the middle of a conference. So there we go. <laughs> the taste of it. So to start to think about wrapping this paper up, integrating Lola into the afternoon. So costume and choreography aside, the remaining challenge was how best to integrate the dance within the afternoon. And what it ultimately came down to was a tale of two cousins. Scandalous Lola Montez and her quiet English cousin Mary Isabella Gascoigne. Both women had rich three-dimensional stories to share beyond just reputation and ruin, and it was important that we shared this with visitors as part of changing historical perceptions. Drawing upon the cousins' historical lack of familiarity with one another, we settled on drawing the many parallels that the women shared in music, faith, book writing, charitable works, and a notable lack of success with men and marriage. Such a framework really allowed me to explore the depths of Lola's story. Her showgirl days behind her, Lola turned to even lectured on the art of beauty, sharing tips on etiquette and appearance supposedly gleaned from her global tours. We think some of it's probably made up. Supported by the publication of her book, which also included a series of comical criticisms on the male psyche, Montez became known on both sides of the Atlantic for a slightly less risque reputation. Unfortunately, things didn't really last, though. After several divorces and countless affairs, by her mid-30s, Lola actually found herself in New York as an all-but-impoverished recipient of a charity for fallen women, run by an old-school friend from her boarding school years in Scotland. Seemingly unconvinced by the life she'd led, venereal disease contracted decades earlier took her life aged just 39, as a sincere volunteer and actual penitential Christian, delivering and doing justice as an actress and interpreter to such a detailed narrative around the spider dance and within such a short space of time was really challenging from my perspective. It's led me to reflect on the idea of how we do justice to historical figures and moments when we recreate them as part of public history practice. For now, I still don't have any clear answers, but it all seemed to be well received as far as the public component of the workshop, and the Lord Mayor of Leeds was there for the event and kindly gave uh, Emily Nice and Medals this sort of badges for, for being there. Closing reflections, so where does this all leave us? practical experiment in negoti negotiating truth and fiction in a blend of past and present, the experience has encouraged me in many ways in my own research. Having long wanted to explore costume and choreography as part of public history, the project was a fantastic opportunity for reflection upon my own practice. The community exhibition programme has been designed to amplify the voices and value of heritage volunteers and the diverse experiences they can bring to sharing and changing public understandings and perceptions of the past. Above all, the afternoon was seen as a great success by the Robertson team, and I do look forward to future appearances as my own sort of Lola Montez. Thank you. Sorry for going over slightly there. Okay, thank you very much. So now we can take a question. So if I can ask the three speakers to come back and answer any questions that we have. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. No, thank you. It's really interesting. Um, so I guess uh, to add, I guess the second, the two versions that I spoke about aren't the only versions that are possible. They were the two that I encountered over the course of my research. Um, for example, my own experience of interpreting a historic kitchen didn't involve a costume at all, so I guess you might consider that the third version of a performance that could take place in that space. Um, there are also examples of where costume interpreters do, um, do inhibit a character but then have the freedom to step out of that character when they need to, so that's another example, maybe a compromise between the two options that I talked about. In terms of my perfect version, I think as someone who is interested in sort of food as an interpretive tool and how food history can be told in those spaces, I think I favour the third person approach that allows you to sort of um, to use sort of 
critical reflection and to contextualise um, the sort of recreations and performances that are, are taking place in the historic kitchen. I think that allows for comparison between past and present, um, but as I discussed, the way in which that third person is used at the moment is perhaps imperfect. So I think I would use third person, but using the improvements that I talked about, so thinking about wider themes and also making meaningful links between past and present that allow visitors to the heritage site or co-performers, I guess, to, um, to reflect critically on the present and on the past and maybe use the past to illuminate the present. I wonder if you have the same question, so thank you. Any more questions? Question for Esther. I was really fascinated that you kept bringing up the concept of tone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously, it's quite a nebulous concept in general. It's quite similar to something I'm very interested in, which is the idea of atmosphere in spaces and places. And I noticed during the video that, like, you were it was it was daylight, and you were surrounded by the. It wasn't quite velvet rope, but it was yeah. you know some. And I was just wondering how you sort of negotiated the site specificness of yeah. that. And indeed, whether you sort of thought about tone in any, any sort of like formalised sense when you're constructing the piece. Yeah. Sorry, it's a question in there somewhere. But yeah. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> tone. Yeah. Tone. Go. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting, um, and I think I've come across this idea of museums as quite performative spaces, which is something I really want to explore more when we're thinking about sort of tone um, and atmosphere. I think. For this, I was quite I was quite limited in what I could do in the space. Um, not only was I on carpet, um, but also I had to negotiate people. So that was just sort of a, a snapshot. Stephanie wanted some surviving footage of the fact that I'd been there and done something. Um, but there were people in that room when I had to do that. Um, and they were in the middle of a tour led by my friend. So there were lots of interesting things to navigate. Um, I mean, we can never really accurately uh, sort of recreate the tone of what it would have been like at the time um, as I'm not on a stage in like mid 19th century Australia or anything like that and I think um, it would be really interesting to have other spaces and other attempts at experimenting with tone and performance tone and the way that people, um, visitors would engage with that. I think it'd be really interesting. I think for this it was very much, the tone was set by the fact that it was a tour um, and a bit of a heritage afternoon experience so this was like the first component and like about an hour later, I was talking to them about like 19th century etiquette and beauty as myself, but still in the costume. Um, so there, I think there was lots of really complicated things with the tone I had to go with. Um, and again, I couldn't fall over or go too far, kick something, because it would have been in like some sort of protected object that I didn't want to damage. Um, but I think there's a lot of space to really think about tone and the way in which um, we interact with that in sort of heritage sector or in any sort of um, history space. I think it's really interesting with uh, connections with some of the stuff you were saying as well, Georgia, um, sort of the, the, the kitchens and, and things and how we act in those spaces. Um, don't know if that answers the question, but hopefully some interesting comments. Absolutely, <laughs> thank you. No problem. It was really interesting, and it strikes me that there are interesting parallels across our papers about women's history and public history and embodied histories. Um, but I had a question for Kelly actually, because I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, Thank you. And <laughs> I was just thinking about that those final statues, um, and it was wonderful that you took us through the process of how they were created. And I, I just wondered if there's kind of there's something there about how this is both a memorial to the past, but also it kind of um, is a memorial to the process that those women went through. Um, the women who posed for the statue, who kind of went through that selection process as well, and I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. You know, is there, um, is this something that we see in her work? This kind of connection between the past and the present. How do we think about that? Yeah, definitely. And I think throughout the whole of the project, all the women spoke at every single stage about the connections and 
with each other and with the heritage organisation and with research and sort of their place in time and like with the legacy makers we get in say women from America and with the people from Nottingham they really created something special and I think Rachel Carter is working sort of like literally on the forefront on the edge of what is possible between public history heritage community engagement and um, with the last key speaker earlier I think that is the, the direction we're all going and that's the direction we need to go but also it does raise some really interesting and difficult problems because Rachel Carter has to manage all these women's expectations but she doesn't leave it at the door she sees these and sometimes these women are a bit older and a lady unfortunately passed away during the making of the project but she kind of has to deal with that so it, it raises some questions on like memorialising and holding space for people within the heritage sector but are we do we have the skills to do that and are, are we progressing and what's best practice so it's just ever evolving and like the work she's going to be doing in the future is like it's crazy it's, and I think that's why I chose the title of like uh, the unusual artist of heritage yeah about the onion because it just carries on the more you look at it the more it, it's, it just it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and more and more interesting so I think yeah any questions I think we have time for one more if we have one more Um, so going back to spider dance, I was kind of interested on, obviously this is something that would count as, can, as scandalous mm -hmm. for its time, how do you best set the correct expectation or the correct context for, because if I'm just a random family who is not very really versed in history, we, spend it, we decide to spend an afternoon out in a historic house, how do you communicate the correct context for the dance to make sense, yeah. because it really wouldn't for a modern person otherwise? Yeah, I think I was very fortunate uh, that for me the context was created by the fact that people had actually booked onto the tour um, and there was a bit of blurb about, you know, who was Mary Elizabeth Gascoigne, who was Lola Montez and sort of, so that I was given a context, um, but I think it raises really interesting questions about how we do contextualise things that may be a bit unexpected within the heritage environment. Lopperton Hall also has like a whole zoo section as well, so it's very much a family space as well. Um, but they're very much trying to get the, the house history out there so it isn't just, oh, yeah, there's some stuff outside and some random collections and stories inside. Um, so I think it does, like, your question does raise really interesting ideas around how do we actually contextualise things like dance. It's not very often you see, like, dance happening at a, a historic house, I suppose, as part of um, sort of interpretation, at least. It, it hasn't been from what I've, I've seen, and I think if it hadn't been for the context that I was given of this is this is the tour, this is what you're looking on to, um, it would have been probably quite difficult <laughs> to, have, to have done so. And I mean, it was structured either side within the sort of the conversation between the girl playing my, my cousin and, and, and my own character. Um, and I think also a lot of people who came on the tour were people already very familiar with the house history and maybe who she was. Um, so I was fortunate. I'm, I'm not going to submit like history context at all. I didn't necessarily mean like history context, but more like sensibility one, if that makes sense. Um, it just, like, how do you explain that, like, saying this much, like, or ankle? <laughs> For some societies, yeah. that would be like horribly obscene. Yeah. And I don't think how you, I couldn't even begin to find how you communicate things like that effectively yeah. in five minutes before a dance or two. Yeah, it's pretty tricky, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Um, it's something I'd love to spend more more time doing, I think. Um, and yeah, at the end of the day, I just had to make up some choreography that seemed to balance the different sort of expectations and perspectives of what I knew or could understand historically. Um, but yeah, there's there's always limitations that we have to operate within, and there's always space that you want to go deeper. And I, I got to chat to people afterwards anyway, so thankfully there was a bit more space. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we have 13 minutes until our next session. So have you know feel free to grab a coffee or anything like that and you will be back if you can be back quarter two for the final session that would be great. Thank you very much.